Well, that's six o'clock. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you uh, for joining us for session six of the Hazelnut Academy. Tonight, we wrap up this journey that we started at the beginning of the month when we learned about the Iowa Hazelnut Project, the landforms of Iowa, and how you can get involved collaborating with the Iowa Nut Growers Association through our on-farm network of growers and the hazelnut test plots. So tonight we're going to be talking about marketing basics, uh, just some record keeping basics, some food safety basics, and then return to the enterprise budget to take a maybe a little closer look at the income side of the ledger. Now, notice I said basics for all of these topic items, and that's because each of them could really be a whole session to themselves. And what I really want to do is expose you to these topics so you have a better understanding of the issues so that you can make better decisions and then, of course, seek out more information if you need it. So at the end of this session, I hope you come away with a basic understanding of marketing in shell nuts and kernels, some basic record keeping for growers, what a food safety plan is. Okay, so uh, what is your goal, right? What is your goal? So if you've ever been in 4-H or FFA, you know the importance of record keeping. Uh, in addition to the basics like when the seedlings were planted or where you got the seedlings, or where they are located. So mapping, for example. Uh, there's a range of other information that it's going to be useful to track. And this is especially important if you are a collaborating grower uh, so that you can learn from one another. And I'll go over some of the data worksheets that we use for the joint performance trials uh, that are scattered throughout the Midwest. But I love the old saying, you can't manage what you don't measure uh, because it's so true. And of course, we want to have improved management decisions. We can't afford to be losing plants for whatever reason. And so if we can learn from the growers that came before us, we can hopefully not repeat those same mistakes. And as I've said time and time again, we really do need some good data from these experimental genotypes so that we can eventually make some of these future recommendations. Okay. So I've got a, a short little video here, and I want to show you what some of the parameters are that we're keeping track of as part of these joint performance trials. So this is our joint performance trials data collection guide, and you can see all of these categories. So maturity date, when they're, when they're ripe and ready to go, that harvest date, the plant height, and then the plant width, and then that in-shell yield, so just weighing it all up. And then finally, we want to do a nut analysis where we're going to get down to those 20 nuts, crack them out, uh, eventually do a, a weight of the kernels so that we can tell what that kernel to shell ratio was going to be or their percentage. And then, of course, if they've got lots of blanks or if for whatever reason they're moldy or, or, or just a poor quality. And then that EFB rating. And EFB, of course, is the Eastern Filbert blight. And so we want to keep track of that because that is one of the main disease concerns with hazelnuts. And so uh, we would take a look at that. And that's typically in the fall. Uh, when After the leaves have fallen, you can see the stems and uh, uh, you'd be able to then make a numerical. Um, um, and so then here is what one of our sheets would look like out in the field where we would have the location ID, the name of that genotype. And then we would be filling in uh, uh, the height, the weight, uh, the uh, height, the width, and then if they had any uh, male catkins on them. And um, you can see some of the red lines there would represent some plants that died. And then those other numbers, again, are, are height and width because we want to try to find a volumetric area of the plant. That's one of the ways that we can uh, really get down to yield. If we're measuring yield on a volumetric basis, uh, that's a way to compare from just bigger plants, older plants versus smaller plants. Uh, but if we're looking at the overall size volume of that shrub and then the nuts that are produced from it, it's a, it can make a nice comparison. 
Okay, so uh, next up is a food safety plan. And the reason I included this topic in this final session is because I think it's important. Uh, growers wanting to take that next step from in-shell nuts to kernels and then value-added products will need a food safety plan. Uh, in my opinion, and specific to hazelnuts, um, they're generally a safe product. So we don't have a whole lot to worry. It's not like they're going to spoil or uh, go rancid or make you sick or anything like that. Um, even more, I think a, a food safety plan is probably even more important than processing in a licensed facility because the food safety plan is going to force you to think through all the necessary steps that you need to take to ensure that you're delivering a clean, wholesome, and safe product. And so what is a food safety plan? Well, it simply is your farm's guide to minimizing the potential for contamination of your produce, in this case, your hazelnuts. And it's also going to be your farm's policies and practices to keep that produce, your nuts, safe for the consumer. And so the good part about this is that you get to set the policies and practices within it. Uh, in a nutshell... <laughs> In a nutshell, the food safety plan is really just pulling together all of those policies and log sheets and records and, and actions that you've documented into one comprehensive document. And there are many resources to help you develop your, your own food safety plan. Now, the one that I'm most familiar with is actually the University of Minnesota website on farm food safety planning. And this is actually a resource uh, I use to develop my own food safety plan. Let's take a look here. So here's the website, and this is what you would see if. So again, I think that's uh, one of the greatest resources for food safety plans because it's really comprehensive, but it's not the only one. And so what's important is that you use whatever you're comfortable with, but definitely have one that is a food safety plan. So I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, <clears throat> thinking through the different hazelnut products that you might find yourself selling 
uh, from maybe the least processed uh, to the most. So when you really get down to it, hazelnuts that are in the husk are going to have a pretty limited market. And we do have some examples of some folks trying, or not trying, we do have some examples of folks selling them to, um, we have some examples of folks that have actually fed uh, nuts in the husk to pigs and they'll gobble them right up. Uh, so if you could uh, utilize the hogs in some way, that might be an opportunity, but it's going to be a really limited market uh, to try to, to sell them in this way. So at least some sort of value added processing, if it's just to get the husk off. And so the next step is going to be those whole cleaned in shell nuts. So the nice round little, little round nuts, uh, of course, they're still going to need to be cracked, but at least with whole cleaned in shell nuts, you have something that could be sold to a processor or even to some folks that might want to crack their own nuts. But still, we are talking about a relatively um, uh, small market in terms of what folks at home are really, because remember, these are so much smaller than those great big Oregon nuts that we're competing in the market with. So certainly you can find some uh, friends and family that can purchase those in shell nuts. Uh, DNR sometimes will purchase nuts for further planting out in or selling for seed, I should say. Um, farmers markets can be a possibility. And then, of course, some processors, uh, the American Hazelnut Company is one in, in uh, Wisconsin that's purchasing nuts right now. So there are some options at the very least. Kernels certainly offer uh, more marketing opportunities overall, but they're also going to require more work and, and effort. That's for sure. So again, the opportunities here are going to be direct marketing to friends and family, maybe some end users in restaurants or, or through a website. Uh, and then, of course, those farmers markets. Kernels are going to give you a much wider basis by which you're going to be able to um, sell those nuts, and then people will just gobble them up because they do taste great. Uh, roasted hazelnuts are delicious. And then, of course, folks mixing them in with things like chocolates or in salads or whatever the case may be. So kernels are definitely going to be that final end use. But even they can be then made into other things. So, for example, um, here's all sorts of things from Nutella to a, a Bath and Body Works shower gel that can be uh, that has some hazelnuts in it, um, toasted hazelnuts in this case. So there's all sorts of opportunities for value-added products. But once you get to that level, you're really looking at maybe doing some uh, branding and then having a website to be able to get a wider audience to sell those value-added products. So speaking of doing some marketing, uh, marketing is a topic that can – you can basically get a degree in it. Uh, but when you boil it down, there's really three takeaways that I find to be uh, the most important. And honestly, the first one is going to be document your goals. And so notice I said goals. You can never escape the need to think through your goals. And a broad goal of making a profit or becoming a millionaire is simply not going to cut it. So you need to know your customer. That's the other thing. Uh, I think this is a given and it's oftentimes overlooked. Uh, but if you don't know who you're selling to, you're not going to know the best strategy to use to engage them. And then finally, this SWOT, this S-W-O-T, and it stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And it's really a process of self-reflection, uh, fact-finding, and then maybe planning to try and identify those assets and those barriers to marketing success. Um, again, it's just a way to systematically think through the things that are important. Now, a valuable tool that I basically use on a monthly basis is the Ag Decision Maker that Iowa State University hosts. And I imagine that Wisconsin probably has something similar. And I know that Minnesota has lots of good resources as well. But let's take a look at that, incidentally, because I think it's worth um, just familiarizing you all 
with this. And so here's what the Ag Decision Maker website is going to look like. And you can see across the top there, you have the crops, the livestock, the whole farm, uh, business development, cooperative, so on and so forth. Uh, you can see how it's kind of laid out here. Um, let's take a look here. Maybe marketing. There we go. So some good information on just understanding marketing and, and some basic primer information. Uh, and you can see how the information is organized. A lot of these are going to be uh, PDF, uh, PDF files that you're going to be able to get access to. Sometimes there'll be Excel spreadsheets. Um, the teaching activities are where, ones where they're a little bit more interactive and engaging. And so that's nice. And then certainly the blue ones are where there's actually a, a voice behind it or a voice media type of a product. Uh, but for the most part, it's just accessing a lot of these uh, PDF documents. And so, you know, do you know your customer? Um, understanding consumers, right? Conducting some of that basic market research. Uh, when you get into direct marketing, whether it's going to be on the internet, a lot of marketing is done at festivals and events. So that's the catering kind of route. And then uh, if you want to get into more of those institutional uh, situations, how to go about that, uh, you can see their promotion, uh, which is always important. Then you get down into some of that branding information where, you know, if you want to actually take that value added product, take it to that next step and really build that brand. Um, and so this has got some good information on that as well. Take a look here, just primer. So just a marketing primer for business. And you can see here uh, the authors, some basic information. Couple of unbreakable rules. Know your customer, know your competition. Yep. So right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> There's the four P's of marketing, but I've heard that expanded to the uh, five, six, or seven P's of marketing. And so there you go. Again, some just really good basic information I find. Um, and you can see from business development, you can get into things like operations. So if you just don't know a whole lot about business and, and how to start a business or how a board of directors works or the different roles and responsibilities, um, budgeting, you know, how do you budget capital expenditures? And so just a lot of those basics. Um, oh, the analysis tab there. That's a good one, too. But. Then you can get into the whole farm, and this is really where it opens up a Pandora's box of a wealth of information. And this is how I use it, again, like on a monthly basis, just looking up uh, some of those resources from weights and measures to, to other. Oh, there you go. And so that you can see is how the how the information is organized, whether it's one of those teaching activities or whether it's that voiced media. And then so just another way to present that information. Uh, so if you just prefer to look at the spread, your spreadsheets or PDFs, or if you need something more of a, a handholding to just go through those engagement activities. But yeah, very valuable. Um, this is the Ag Decision Maker from Iowa State University. Okay, let's get back to the enterprise worksheet. Uh, we've hit the various sections of this. And so we want to get back to it here and uh, look at, again, our expenses. So when we first started here, what are going to be those startup and establishment cost expenses? You can see the range that we have there running from... <clears throat> 54 to almost 15,000 per acre. Then we get into the ongoing labor and maintenance and all of those different categories from the land rent cost to your soil testing to your maintenance of mowing, weed control. And you can see that range of almost $600 to over 1300 
Now we get to harvesting the nuts. And this is where things really start to fall off the rails. So uh, this is a considerable expense when we start looking at a dollar a pound just to harvest the nuts when we're only getting maybe a dollar twenty-five, a dollar fifty. You know, can you get much more than that per pound right now? It depends. And so we need to be able to drive that price down to twenty cents, maybe or less. And that's where we can finally achieve some profitability. But to get to that point, we need the plants to be able to get us there that are machine harvestable and that have some of these decent yields. Okay, so now on the income side of things, uh, again, these are the assumptions that we used. Uh, we used an assumption of 580 plants per acre. Um, maybe that's a little bit low for what might be recommended, but we just don't know quite yet. Uh, we use that two pounds per plant as the uh, yield price of a dollar a pound, labor of $10 an hour. Well, you can tell that this is a somewhat dated document. Uh, you're not going to get that anywhere around here. And so if we're looking at a yield, and again, this is per acre from year 10 through 20 of uh, roughly 1160 pounds and then your price per pound there ranging from 50 cents uh, if you were able to sell all of your crop as maybe a seed crop maybe you could get five dollars a pound and that's going to be your total income so what happens when we all of a sudden change some of these parameters so what if we go, when we were had uh, this yield down here and went from two pounds per plant, what if we were able to double that to four? And what if we were able to, to get a, a $1.50 per pound, right? Well, now all of a sudden we're looking at, uh, what's that, $3,480? Keep in mind, your harvesting costs are going to be relatively the same. Uh, you're going to have us um, uh, slightly more with the increase in the overall volume of nuts. Now, what happens if we take that yield up to six pounds? And again, at $1.50 a pound. Now we're looking at 5,220. And then if we get that up to eight, so if we had some of these high producing plants that could on a relatively consistent basis get hit that eight pounds per plant number, now all of a sudden at $1.50 a pound, we're talking at almost $7,000 an acre. That's definitely a specialty crop right there. And so you can see some of these different assumptions that we put together here. Uh, that's a big difference from uh, maybe 1,100 or 1,700 an acre up to almost 7,000 per acre. So the take-home story here is we need better plants that can produce. And then, of course, we need to get plants that are going to be able to be machine harvested so we can really drive down that labor cost of a dollar per pound. Keep in mind that there can be some efficiencies to even improve upon that dollar per pound figure just by getting some clonal material. So imagine, you know, if, if you have a whole row that's basically ripe and ready to go and you can turn the workers leaves to just pick, 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 um, there's can be some efficiencies gained there beyond or, or I should say above what happens in the real world, which is they have to pick and choose what bushes are ready to go, uh, even if they're um, not the ones making the decision on whether the, the shrub is ripe. Uh, they might be, you might have someone come through and tag uh, shrubs so that the workers just pick those plants that are uh, tagged. But even so, um, 
there's time spent going from one side of the row to the other to be sure that you're getting the right plant where, again, if they were all relatively ripe, you could just pick one down, down one side, down the other, zippity doo da. So there's definitely some synergies, some efficiencies that can be gained, and uh, we can get that overall cost to harvest down considerably. So just want to remind you of some of those hazelnut resources that are out there, that Landowner's Guide to Perennial Crop Options, the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, um, and then the Hazelnut Consortium. And then from the Iowa Nut Growers Association, they have their YouTube page uh, where a lot of these recorded sessions are going to be found, as well as the Iowa Hazelnut Project on Facebook, and then our website where you can find great information as well. Well, it was kind of short and sweet here tonight to wrap things up. Uh, I hope uh, folks enjoyed uh, this series and got something out of it. I know I had a lot of fun uh, uh, talking to all of you and learning about your operations and answering your questions as we've gone through this whole process of planning, planting, maintenance, harvesting, processing, and then marketing. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time.